Welcome to our podcast today. We're glad that you've taken the time to join us. And speaking of joining us, for those of you that are watching on YouTube, don't forget, please hit that like button and share with your friends if you would. Subscribe and be a part of what we're doing. That's the only way we'll be able to continue to do these podcasts on a regular basis and give you this information. So be a part of the program and be sure and like us. Today's podcast is going to be um, directed towards the ancestry of Abraham. Last time we met, we, we talked about the life and times of Abraham. Today, we're going to talk about Abraham's son, Isaac, and his grandson, Jacob. This podcast is going to reference numerous place names, show you a, a lot of maps and some archaeological evidence that would support the historicity of Abraham's ancestry. So we're excited to present this material for you. Um, need to review, though, uh, the chapters that we would be um, reading relative to this particular uh, uh, podcast. It would be Genesis chapters 24 through chapters 33. And there's a number of extremely unique items that we want to uh, emphasize and talk about uh, found in those chapters. To begin with, we want to go back to Genesis chapter 15, uh, verse 2. We're trying to find out the name of Abraham's servant or the steward of his home. So we're going to go to Genesis 15, 2 and read, And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And so Abraham is quite concerned in this particular verse about who is going to be there. And now a mere house servant is going to get it all. Well, he's not going to get it all because eventually Isaac is going to be born. The Lord is going to bless Abraham and uh, he will have a son whose name will be Isaac, which leads us now to why we needed to know Eliezer's name, because he's going to receive a charge to go and find the wife, a wife for Isaac. Now, Abraham is really concerned about the wicked influences of those that are outside of the covenant. And so he puts Eliezer under an oath to find a wife for his son from his own patriarchal lineage. Now, this oath is not merely a verbal oath. It was done by a special sign. In the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 24, 8, it says, And the servant put his hand under the hand of Abraham his master and swear to him concerning this matter. Well, a man putting his hand under the hand of the one who rules over him was a sign of loyalty and a, and a, and a desire to want to fulfill the desires of the master, in this case, of course, to find a wife for Isaac. Continuing the Joseph Smith translation of verses 9 and 10, we learn that the servant took ten camels of his master, and he departed. For all the goods of his master were in his hands. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia and to the city of Nahor. Now, we discussed in an earlier podcast the cities that were in and around Abraham's hometown of Ur in upper Mesopotamia. One of those towns that was nearby was Haran, and another one was Nahor. And you can see from the slide that's here that Eliezer set out from Berlaheroi, Berlaheroi, the site of an important well that we're going to be talking about here shortly. And he goes up to Nahor to find a wife for, uh, for Isaac. And uh, this is a trip of 900 miles round trip. So this is a very, very dedicated and faithful servant. But the question might be asked, why, do we, why go 900 miles round trip when you could just slip over to Salem, Melchizedek City, and certainly you could find a righteous wife for Isaac? Well, as we mentioned in our last podcast, um, they probably weren't there. Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 14 tells us, And men having this faith coming up into the order of God were translated and taken up into heaven. And now Melchizedek was a priest of this order. Therefore he obtained peace in Salem and was called the Prince of Peace. And his people wrought righteousness and obtained heaven. And sought for the city of Enoch, which God had before taken, separating it from the earth, having reserved it unto the latter days or the end of the world. Well, 
with no Salem or the city of Melchizedek to be found, were off to Nahor. So Eliezer did what the brother of Jared did. He presented a plan to the Lord to solve this problem of trying to find a wife for Isaac. In Genesis 24, 14, he presents the plan. Let it come to pass, the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels to drink also. Well, let her be the one whom thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. So there's his plan. Well, it happened just that way. Her name was Rebecca. And in Hebrew, Rebecca means to tie firmly or to bind. Now, Rebecca was the daughter of Bethuel. That's Nahor's son. And this is going to make Rebecca Isaac's first cousin once removed. Now, the key phrase in this plan of Eliezer was, I will give thy camels to drink also. And that's what she said. So now I'm going to digress just a minute, and I want to address this idea of um, domesticated camels. First, Eliezer takes 10 camels with him. In verse 11, he says, they kneel down by the well. In verse 32, it says, he unburdened his camels to give them straw. In verse 66, Rebekah and her maid, Deborah, rode upon the camels. And in verse 69, and Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camels. So were camels domesticated beast of burden during the patriarchal reign of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because it wasn't always thought to be the case. In fact, forever, it was thought the camels were not domesticated until after 1300 BC, long after the patriarchs. However, there's now clear evidence that camels were used during the patriarchal reign of Abraham. Clay figures and wooden carvings, uh, mural paintings, and in fact, pieces of camel bone and camel hair have all been discovered in graves found in Egypt and in Mesopotamia. Camels were domesticated, and archaeology continues today to verify the biblical story. And so our faithful servant returns with Rebecca in tow, but not without the assistance of an angel. In Genesis 24, 40, it says, And he said to me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee. So Eliezer's got some, uh, got some good, a good guide, an angel that was with him at the time. And so as our story goes, Abraham lives to see Isaac marry. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac, and these are the days and years of Abraham's life, a hundred, threescore, and fifteen years. Abraham lived to be a hundred and seventy-five, and was buried next to Sarah in the cave of Machpelah. Well, Isaac and Rebekah pitched their tent where Abraham was living at the time, by the well Berlaheroi. Now, we referenced Berlaheroi just a few minutes ago. And you can see on the map, Belahero is in, in yellow there, and that's, that's where these good folks are at. Now, now, why is this well so important? And we're going to regress again a little bit and go back with Abraham and uh, the first son that he had through Hagar. So when Hagar conceives, um, Abraham's wife, Sarah, is not happy. Of course, Hagar, I think, is flaunting this a little bit in, in uh, Sarah's face. So Sarah dealt hardly with her, and she fled from her face. And so Hagar finds herself out in the desert near a fountain of water. She, uh, she is convinced by an angel to return to Sarah and Abraham. And so she does. She returns, and she bears a son named Ishmael. That would be Abraham's first son. Well, this fountain where Hagar was at, Berlacheroi, is also where Abraham now calls home, and it's also where Isaac now calls home. So literally following the patriarchs through the desert, you're going to follow them from well to well and valley to valley as they move their flocks and herds about. So Berlacheroi is kind of an important well. Now, just a thought about Ishmael. Um, we need to give some credit here to, uh, to Hagar and to Ishmael. Ishmael will live to be 137 years old. Now his 12 sons eventually are going to take wives and have children. And through these children, the tribes 
tribes are going to be formed. And these tribes are going to make up the nations that dwell from Egypt all the way up through to Assyria. Ishmael was an Arab. Arabs consider him a messenger and a prophet. Now, some of the tribes of Ishmael that you might have heard of are the uh, Juktanites, um, the Arameans, Moabites, Ammonites, um, Ishmaelites, Midianites, and Amalekites. All of these are from the ancestry of Ishmael. All right, back to our story with Isaac. Now, I love this picture. I think it portrays exactly what's happening here. <laughs> Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled within her. And she said, Why am I thus? And the Lord said, Two nations are in thy womb, and one shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. And I kind of like this picture too. The first child was Esau. And his name meant Harry, but his descendants are going to be from Edom, the Edomites, which means red. So kind of reddish and hairy. The second twin was called Jacob, meaning he shall follow at the heel. Now the knowledge that, uh, that Rebekah had received prior to Jacob's birth, that he would receive the birthright, I'm sure this labored in her mind for decades. How can this possibly happen? where the birthright should go to Esau. Now, this lends to a little bit of an archaeological discussion. We're going to give some credence now to the customs and laws during the reign of the patriarchs to help us better understand this Esau-Jacob story. Nuzi, Nuzi is an ancient Mesopotamian city near the Tigris River, and uh, that's today in modern-day Iraq. In 1925, 20,000 clay tablets were found dating from 1500 to 1350 BC. And these tablets verify some of the patriarchal customs and laws of the time that help us to understand why people, in particular our patriarchs, did what they did. And I want to share a few of those with you. First of all, a barren wife must provide her husband a slave girl through whom he may have children such as Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham. A person could sell a birthright to another individual, such as Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a pot of porridge. A childless couple could adopt someone to care for them who would in the end inherit their property, and this is what Abraham feared with regards to Eliezer. A birthright son was entitled to a double portion, that is twice as much as any other son, of the father's inheritance. One portion as a son, and the second portion as the new head responsible for the family. And then lastly, a deathbed testament or a blessing by the head of the family had the force of law and was binding. This would be like Isaac and his blessing of Jacob as opposed to Esau. I'm sure you can see how these customs were used throughout the reign of the patriarchs. Well, Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob, and so something, something had to give. At this point in our narrative, we have a second famine that is going to hit this land. But Isaac is told not to go to Egypt. Instead, he stays in the land of his inheritance, and he follows the wells, and he follows his herds. In Genesis 26, verses 20 through 22, we identify three of Isaac's wells. The well of Essek, which means strife. The well of Sitna, which means hatred. And the well of Rehoboth, which means compromise. Now, when you put these three wells together, they tell the story of living among the Canaanites. Strife, hatred, and eventual compromise. Now, if you look at the... Uh, the slide, the map, you're going to see where Essek and Sitna are and Rehoboth, and then below that you see Beersheba. And so that is where Isaac's going to settle, is in Beersheba. Now, Elder Theodore Tuttle once gave a talk entitled Altar, Tent, Well. In his talk, he said, In Genesis 27, we learn how Rebekah is going to intercede to ensure Jacob receives the birthright. 
Rebekah knew by personal revelation that Jacob was the son chosen by the Lord. Uh, the question might be asked, did the Lord tell Rebekah to do what she did to ensure the birthright was given to Jacob? That's certainly a possibility. Well, Isaac could have undone or revoked the blessing, but he did not. Perhaps he realized or even remembered that this is exactly what the Lord wanted to have happen. So Jacob, like his father, Isaac, goes in search of a wife at this time. And like Isaac, he's going to marry from the house of Bethuel. Isaac married Laban's sister, Rebekah, and Jacob is about to marry two of Laban's daughters in Haran. As Jacob leaves to go and find a wife, he's doing it for another reason as well. Esau, his brother, is quite upset that he did not receive the birthright and has threatened to kill Jacob. So Jacob's going to leave. And he's going to go 60 miles north, and there he's going to lie and rest. And why he rests, he has a very, very important dream. It's found in Genesis 28, verses 12 through 15. And it says, And he dreamed and beheld a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascended and descended on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed." And they say, Seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again to this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Now, because Jacob had met the Lord at this particular spot and entered into a covenant with the Lord, he considered this site to be very, very sacred. And he named the place Bethel, which means house of the Lord. Jacob said, this place is the gate of heaven. Now, you can see in the map on the upper left-hand corner, you can see Beersheba at the bottom, 60 miles north, is Bethel. And that's where this event took place. Picture in the top right corner is an 1894 photo of what Bethel looked like, and that's what Bethel looks like today. In the March 1971 Enzyme, Elder Marion G. Romney gave a talk that was entitled, Temples, the Gates of Heaven. He stated, You will recall in the 28th chapter of Genesis, there's an account of Jacob returning to the land of his father to seek a wife from among his own people. When Jacob travels from Beersheba towards Haran, he had a dream in which he saw himself on the earth at the foot of a ladder that reached to heaven where the Lord stood above it. He beheld angels ascending and descending thereon, and Jacob realized that the covenants he made with the Lord there were the rungs on the ladder that he himself would have to climb in order to obtain the promised blessing. Blessings that would entitle him to enter heaven and associate with the Lord. Because he had met the Lord and entered into covenants with him there, Jacob considered the site so sacred that he named the place Bethel, a contraction of Beth Elohim, which means literally the house of the Lord. He said of it, this is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Well, temples are to us what Bethel was to Jacob. Even more so, they are also the gates to heaven for all of our kindred dead. We should all do our duty in bringing our loved ones through those gates. Now, that's an incredible uh, vision that Jacob had at Bethel. Well, as the story goes, Jacob, who had deceived Esau, his brother Esau, to get the birthright, is about to be deceived by his uncle Laban. Now, this concept of deception seems to be practiced on occasion with this family from Bethel. However, we learn from modern-day revelation that Jacob, quote, did none other thing than that which he was commanded to do and is today exalted upon a throne in heaven in company with Abraham and Isaac. That's found in Doctrine and Covenants, section 132. Well, like Isaac's wife, Rebekah, Jacob finds his wife, Rachel, at the well. The well seems to be the place where you find your, your future <laughs> wife. And I'm sure you know the story. Ane Leah Rachot. Leah is lackluster and plain. 
tender-eyed, as the scriptures say. On the other hand, Rachel is greeted with a kiss. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept when he saw her. Um, that's a pretty aggressive first date, in my opinion. And so it was, Laban tricks Jacob to marry Leah. And the ex excuse was this. And Laban said, It must not be done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Well, I've done a little research, and in India, this practice of marriage order is, is still used today. But I have no proof of the existence of any such custom among the house of Bethuel. Well, now this leads us to the great competition of the wives and the handmaidens. Leah bore a son, Reuben. Leah bore another son, Simeon. Leah bore another son, Levi. Leah bore still another son, Judah. Rachel's handmaid, her name is Bilhah. Bilhah bore a son, Dan. Rachel's handmaid bore another son, Nephtili. Leah's, Leah's handmaid now, Zilpha, bore a son, Gad. Leah's handmaid bore another son, Asher. Now this is odd. Listen to this. Leah buys a knight with Jacob for mandrakes, and she bears a son, Isaacar. So what is our current count? Seven children by Leah or Zilpha? Now I'm sure you're asking yourself, what are mandrakes? Well, mandrakes are the root of a potato-like plant that is actually considered to be an aphrodisiac. Uh, relative to the tradition of fertility, mandrakes were, were often taken. Okay, back to our, our head count. Leah conceives again and bears a son, Zebulon. Leah bears a daughter, Dinah. And then finally, Rachel bears a son, and he'll call his name Joseph. So Jacob is 77 years old when he went to work for Laban, and now after 20 years, he's 97 years old, and our Jacob is preparing to leave the employment of Laban. He's got four wives, 11 sons, and a daughter. He also has numerous man and maidservants, and he's also been very, very prosperous with cattle, sheep, and goats. It seems that Jacob has a rather unique way of increasing his flocks and herds. He took rods or branches from poplar, hazel, and chestnut trees, and he peeled the bark to form white stripes on these branches. And then he set the branches in the feeding gutters or the troughs where the animals would come to drink. Now, this apparent superstition was done so the animals would conceive quickly. But, but is it really so strange? In fact, what is probably being alluded to is that the females drank from the water from the troughs and the males would come up from behind them to mate. The striped or spotted limbs were placed in the watering troughs to keep the female animals focused in front, while the male animals came up from behind and bred with them. Also, there's several sources that claim that poplar and chestnut trees have medicinal properties for both humans as well as livestock. There are several scientific journal papers that I've come across that mention that the particular trees from which Jacob peeled sticks supposedly cure urogenital problems, reduce fevers, they work as anti-inflammatories, and aid in reducing reproductive disorders. All of this is going to make animals healthier and more likely to produce healthier offspring. So it's not so strange, perhaps, what Jacob was doing. And I suppose we need to remember that the Lord walked by Jacob's side continually. As Jacob and his entourage were en route back to Canaan, they were overtaken by Laban. It seems that Rachel, Laban's daughter, had stolen the images of her father. Now, Jacob knew nothing about this, and after searching, Laban was unsuccessful in finding whatever these images were. Well, Laban was not thought to have been a worshiper of idols, so what were these images? W. W. Phelps stated that the word used for images is teraphim, and it might be more properly termed spectacles or spyglass, and probably refers to the Urim and Thummim. 
Well, these instruments of revelation were handed down to the leadership of the families, and it seems that Laban had now probably lost his place with leadership if, in fact, the Urim and Thummim were taken. As Jacob is approaching the lands of his brother Esau, he is concerned. Twenty years ago, Esau had threatened to, to kill Jacob. So what was Jacob to, to expect? Well, as he tarried alone pondering one evening about this situation, he was approached by a man, a man who had the power to bless him. And he ended up wrestling this man in an attempt to secure that blessing. But you know, this doesn't seem terribly logical to me. The Hebrew word for wrestle, yebek. And it can also be translated to embrace. Verses 24 through 29 of chapter 32 better reflect a man coming along and giving Jacob a ritual embrace. And he also gave him a new name. Jacob now would be called Israel. He also was given priestly power. So this visiting man or angel had the authority, first of all, to change his name, and second, to give him a blessing, much like the holy endowment that is given in the temples today. Well, our story has a, has a happy ending. As Jacob approaches Esau, he's excited to find out that Esau is just thrilled to see him, and any issues or problems that they had are, are long gone, and they, they certainly reconcile. Jacob and his family settled just east of the city of Shechem on grounds that he purchased from local the local inhabitants. There he builds another altar, and there he digs another well. I want to thank you for joining us today as we've discussed Isaac and Jacob. Our next podcast that we have will cover uh, Genesis chapters 37 through 50, and it'll be the story of Joseph of Egypt, and we'll introduce also Moses. Thanks again for joining us, and be sure and hit that like button.